I don't usually visit sites with explicit content very often, but one July evening a few months ago, I decided not only to get acquainted with their materials but also to sign up for a premium membership. It seemed to me that the $100 fee was worth it. On the screen, I saw a live broadcast with the participation of an attractive woman. Although I've seen better, there was something about that scene that really disturbed me. The woman's name was Jenna, a hot housewife, but I knew her real name was Kelly. Kelly is my wife. Well, my dear, I must say that it was very impressive. I doubt your man can satisfy you as well, right, hot housewife? John McKellar smiled back at him and confidently replied, Well, Mario, I won't deny that it was nice, just like you said. But just so you know, no one ignites my passion like my husband. I've had several men, but none of them gave me as much pleasure as he did. You are skilled, but he is truly exceptional, so don't stop striving to get better. She smiled at him again. Mario, puzzled, looked at her and asked, If he's really amazing, then why are you betraying him by coming here and letting me do all this with you? She continued to smile and calmly replied, I never wanted this to happen, but I find pleasure in such actions, and I'm glad that you are participating with me. I do this because I get away with everything, and my husband doesn't notice anything. Despite my antics, I truly love my husband, and after three nights spent here, I realized how much better he is compared to what I experienced in other places. It enhances my love and appreciation for him. As already mentioned, the $100 I spent on this turned out to be a justified investment as it allowed me to observe the actions of my beloved wife without resorting to expensive surveillance equipment or private detectives. You may be wondering how I ended up in this situation, what events led me to that fateful night that made me visit this site. The question is quite reasonable, and I think that the most truthful answer to it will be an unexpected stroke of luck, a rare twist of fate that fell to my lot. Not in the sense that my wife was involved with Mario, but in the fact that I found out about her infidelity. Kelly and I have been married for a little over eight years. We first crossed paths in elementary school. We both grew up in the neighborhood of a modest town in central Illinois. While she lived in the city, I lived in the countryside. Her father owned the largest grain elevator in the area. In addition, my father was the owner of the largest grain farm in the region. Considering the business ties of our families, it is quite natural that we met, went to school together, and became friends. I won't go into the details of our childhood hobbies, school romances, and even college studies. We were both looking for acquaintances, and yes, had intimate relationships with other people. We didn't strive for an exclusive relationship, but deep down, I think we always knew that we were destined to be a couple. I was indeed the one who took her innocence, but there were others on our way, both for her and for me. In our freshman year at the University of Illinois, we made a mutual decision to become a couple, and after a while, I got down on one knee and proposed to her. About a year and a half after that unforgettable moment, we got married just a week after graduating from university. We both successfully received diplomas in the specialty of business administration. It seemed that life was going well, or at least that's what I thought, until that fateful July night three years ago. Kelly's parents retired and moved to Phoenix, Arizona. Kelly's sister, Amber, along with her two brothers, Tom and Carl Gentry, made significant investments by acquiring 48% of the grain business from Thomas. He decided to keep a controlling stake for several years to provide financial support for their expansion. Over time, he gradually reduced his share until eventually, they became fully owned by the business. Interestingly, Amber is married to a good friend of mine named Walter Swanson, who is also a farmer. His farm is only slightly smaller than mine and covers several hundred acres. We live in close proximity to each other and often spend time together. Tom and Carl work together to control the grain business, and Kelly acts as a controller. Amber, in turn, is responsible for working with clients and grain sales operations at the enterprise. It is indeed a family-owned enterprise, albeit with a few additional employees consisting mainly of truck drivers and grain handlers. During the busy harvest season, they also hire a few part-time workers. Now that you have received enough background information, I can continue to tell you about the deplorable series of events that occurred when I found out that my wife was behaving inappropriately online with another man and describe in detail what followed the shocking discovery. The Gentry brothers, Tom, Carl, Kelly, and Amber, 
devoted a huge amount of extra time and effort to completing the deal to acquire their father's share in the grain business. Although I did not take an active part in this process, I was aware of how much work they put into making the deal happen. They had to go through meetings with bank representatives, consultations with the Illinois Department of Agriculture, and negotiations with insurance providers. By the time the deal was successfully completed, they were all thoroughly exhausted. Fortunately, this difficult event took place during the winter period when they do not have many working days the year. Since it was the post-harvest period, I didn't need Kelly's help on the farm as much as I did during the two busiest periods of the year. Although Kelly herself was not directly involved in the work on the farm, managing 2,200 acres of corn and soybeans made these periods incredibly stressful for me. I mainly relied on Kelly to run errands and provide support during this stressful time. But considering that we are now in a less stressful period, Kelly and Amber offered to take a few days off to treat themselves to relaxation and rejuvenation at the spa. They immediately booked a trip to the spa for three nights to relax and recuperate. The girls returned from their first spa trip fully rested and rejuvenated. They were so excited about the experience that they decided to plan another trip in July next year when the planting season ends. The tradition continued, and the following year, they booked another weekend at the spa. It was during this weekend that I decided to watch the video on the internet. Coincidentally, Dan Marvel, a field agent of the Illinois Department of Agriculture in our district, accidentally came to visit while making a routine tour of his site. Having known Dan since his student days, he asked about Kelly, and I casually mentioned that she was currently enjoying a vacation at Peace Spa. Dan gave me an unusual look and said that there was an intriguing event going on in the area that he thought might interest me. He said that one of his cousins worked as a masseuse in this spa and told some unusual stories about the events that took place there. According to Dan, another name was even indicated on the spa's website, but he could not remember the exact name, saying only that it was somehow connected with pleasures. Puzzled, I asked, and Dan cautiously admitted that he prefers not to go into details but recommends that I sort out this issue myself. Although I mostly play online poker, his suggestion made me curious. As a person who likes to look at the internet from time to time in search of interesting content, I decided that evening to conduct a little exploration. Less than a few minutes later, I came across the Peace Spa. As soon as I found the live broadcast, everything changed. Now I could recount all the details of that fateful night and explain why it had such a profound effect on me. The truth is, I was devastated. I cried, screamed, experienced the whole range of emotions that any man experiences after learning about his wife's infidelity. In addition, it soon became clear that this was not her first betrayal because a lot of revealing evidence was stored in the Peace Spa archive. In the process of further investigation, I was able to find videos of Kelly and Amber's previous visits to the spa. I found not only the videos of their last visit but also got access to the recordings of the two previous nights at this institution. Thanks to the premium membership, I had the opportunity to download each video for an additional fee of $20. As a result, I decided to upload a total of eight videos, two from the first visit, three from the second, and three from the current trip. The total cost of obtaining all these proofs was $160. Having these videos at my disposal, I knew that now I had indisputable evidence confirming my decision to divorce my wife. So the total amount spent on this venture was $260. Although I didn't have a specific plan yet, I understood that it was necessary to act without delay. I wasn't going to wait a few weeks or even days to achieve our separation. In my opinion, the sooner we part ways, the better. It was impossible to deny that she had engaged in illicit relationships in at least eight cases recorded on video. Moreover, judging by the downloaded videos, I found out that she was dealing with at least two different men, Mario and Steve. I didn't know, and I wasn't interested in whether additional people were involved in this. Two men were more than enough to confirm their decision. To save the video copies, I made several duplicates and kept them in a safe place. When my father was building the house, he had the foresight to install a wall safe, which was accessed through a hidden panel in the built-in bookcase in the study. Carefully hiding the copies, I deleted all references to the Nature's Pleasure Spa from the computer and also permanently deleted all the source files associated with the videos. Apart from the DVD duplicates, there are no more traces of evidence left. After taking all these precautions, 
I took out my cell phone and wrote a text message that was supposed to be sent to Kelly's phone. Kelly, this is Jack. I am fully aware of your activities at Peace Spa, and I have concrete evidence that will confirm my words. If you have any intention of returning to this house, don't worry, this place is no longer your home, and very soon, I will also cease to be your husband. We're done. In the next few days, expect a call from my lawyer to arrange for the return of personal belongings. It looks like Kelly disconnected her phone and didn't know about my message until the next morning, as I didn't receive any response from her that evening. But the next morning, my phone started ringing insistently. Glancing at the caller ID, I saw that it was Kelly and decided not to answer. Soon, I received a voice message from her. Kelly's voice was full of confusion and worry. Jack, what's going on? I have no idea why you're sending such hurtful messages. Amber and I are packing up now, and I'll be home in a couple of hours. Whatever you think I did, you're wrong. Let's talk when I get there. I love you, Jack. Shortly after I heard her answering machine, my mobile phone rang again. I decided not to answer the call again and transferred it to voicemail. To my surprise, it was an identical message, conveyed almost word for word. This made me wonder if she had written her answer in advance. As expected, after I didn't pick up the phone, a text message followed. It seemed like she was stuck on repeat, repeating her words almost verbatim from the two previous posts. Since I didn't feel the need to start a conversation, I decided to send her a short reply in the form of a message, confirming that I had received her messages but decided not to talk to her. My answer was simple, I'm thinking about whether Mario has at least some idea of what you're doing and whether he can shed light on what my message is about. My decision not to return to this house remains valid. You can't go back, Kelly. Our relationship has come to an end. I didn't get any more messages after that message. But later in the afternoon, I got another call from Kelly, leaving another message on my voicemail. She begged, Jack, we really need to talk. I'm going to stay with Amber until we talk and resolve this terrible misunderstanding. Please call me on my mobile so we can discuss everything. It was Sunday afternoon, and I decided not to answer Kelly's call. The next morning, I went to the bank to issue an additional safe deposit box exclusively in my name. In this box, I put one copy of the DVDs with evidence, as well as the original of our marriage contract. In order for the meeting with the lawyer scheduled for 11 a.m. to go smoothly, I made another copy of the prenuptial agreement. Although I knew the lawyer had a copy, I didn't want to leave anything to chance or possible complications. At the appointed time, I entered my lawyer's office and saw that Kelly was already sitting there. When I entered the office, Kelly looked up, and I immediately realized that she looked upset. It was obvious that she had been crying and looked disheveled. Her hair was loose. Kelly said softly, Jack, we really need to discuss this. Surprised, I asked, how did you know I was coming here? She replied, Richard called me when you made an appointment. At that moment, Richard Warner, my lawyer, appeared and asked us both to go to him. Restraining my boiling anger, I answered firmly, No, Richard, we're not going into your office together. You have destroyed my trust by contacting Kelly, and I demand a direct answer from you immediately. Will you represent me and only me? Mocking the fact that lawyers are often considered highly intelligent, I could not help but feel that this particular lawyer does not have the necessary intelligence. He replied, No, Jack. If the situation does not change, I will represent Kelly's interests. It became clear that he considered the grain business to be a more profitable client compared to my farming business. Moreover, it turned out that he already represented the interests of the entire Gentry family, not limited to the grain business. Perhaps this explained his preference. Given my position on this issue, I firmly believed that Richard would eventually realize the fallacy of his thinking. All right, Richard, I replied calmly. Please collect all my original documents and all copies of contracts and papers that you have by 16 o'clock today. I'll either pick them up personally or call a courier to pick them up. I would like to note that I highly appreciate the work that you have done for me in the past, but I must emphasize that you are making a significant mistake in making this decision. Deciding to find a lawyer elsewhere. I added, I will seek legal services from another lawyer, and you can count on my new lawyer to contact you at the earliest opportunity. Kelly had been silent during the entire conversation, but now she pleaded, Jack, 
why don't you want to talk to me now and clear things up? I answered sternly, Kelly, it's obvious that Richard values you as a client more than he values me. I will not enter into this conversation without legal representation, and I cannot trust him in this matter. Richard interjected, Jack, you know I've always been honest with you. You have no reason to worry. Ignoring his words, I replied, Oh, Richard, I have something to worry about. As they say, you can't serve two masters, and it's clear which master you chose. Besides, your current actions have already shown that you cannot be trusted, especially when you invited Kelly to this meeting. Our conversation ends here. Goodbye, Richard. As I was leaving the room, I heard Kelly scream. Resume hell. Now I have to find a new lawyer. Fortunately, I remembered that I had heard positive reviews about David Warren, a lawyer known for his competence and competitiveness like Richard Warner. But I decided to be careful and conduct a thorough study of the situation before making a final decision. Lawyers, accountants, bankers, and insurance agents are people with whom we work closely, and before disclosing important information, it is necessary to thoroughly understand the nature of our relationship. Understanding the importance of the lawyer-client relationship, in which confidential information is often exchanged, I realized the need for careful consideration of the issue. After hearing positive feedback about David, I contacted his law firm and asked if they could provide me with a list of recommendations. The friendly secretary convinced me that they had such a list and promptly agreed to send it to me by email. After receiving the letter, I noticed that four of my friends were on the list. In this regard, I decided to arrange a meeting with three of them to get their opinion and point of view before making a final decision. Surprisingly, it didn't take long as each of them immediately gave me a high assessment of David's legal services. Their recommendations left me in no doubt that he would be an excellent choice to represent my interests. But I decided not to date the fourth friend, Wally, because he is married to Amber, Kelly's sister, and I did not want to involve him in her personal affairs. Strengthening my trust in David, I made a second call to his office. After introducing myself, I asked if I could make an appointment to see him after 4 p.m. The secretary informed me that David was busy until 4.30 p.m. Samantha kindly offered to contact David about my request, but I understood that there was a possibility that he might not be available, and yet I wanted to try. A few minutes later, Samantha came back on the line and informed me that Mr. Warner would indeed be able to see me at 4.30 p.m. But according to her, the meeting should be short since he has things to do for the evening. Understanding the situation, I agreed and assured her that I would arrive shortly before the appointed time. Samantha warmly replied, We look forward to meeting you, Mr. Hagen. By the way, my name is Samantha. I'm David's wife. Arriving at Richard's office at 4 p.m., I expected to receive my paperwork, but to my disappointment, they did not have time to complete the copying process. It became clear that they were stalling, perhaps hoping that I would reconsider my decision. My anger flared up, and I took it out on them, warning them that I needed to get all my legal documents within the next 15 minutes. I made it clear that if they do not comply with the requirements, my new lawyer will contact them soon. When they asked about the identity of my new lawyer, I confidently assured them that they would find out soon. After my outburst, the atmosphere in the office changed quickly. It seemed like a hive of activity, with three people trying to make copies at the same time. After just 20 minutes, I finally had all the sheets of my legal documentation in my hands. Since I still had enough time to get to David's office before the scheduled meeting, I decided not to make too much noise about the delay in the delivery of my documents. At the meeting with David, we discussed the details, and he agreed to represent my interests both personally and in business matters. Wanting to get guarantees of the safety and order of the received documents, I asked if I could leave them with him for safekeeping. Without hesitation, David agreed and guaranteed that he would safely put them in the office storage until we could thoroughly study them together. The next day, Tuesday, at 9 o'clock in the morning, we agreed on a meeting during which we carefully studied all the documents and developed a comprehensive plan for the divorce process. Leaving the office at 5.30 p.m., I exchanged a smile with Samantha and playfully asked, Well, Samantha, has my unexpected visit disrupted your plans for the evening? She smiled and replied, You did a great job, Mr. Hagen. Our plans will be implemented as expected. I would just like all our customers to be as punctual as you are. Appreciating her friendliness, I replied, 
Thank you, and please call me Jack. Mutual understanding was instantly established between us, which allowed us to establish a more personal contact. The next morning, we began a thorough analysis of all my business papers and contracts, but due to attorney-client privilege, I cannot provide specific details. In this context, I can say that David expressed the opinion that everything is fine from a business point of view. After the lunch break, David and Sam, as I call Samantha, kindly invited me to join them at a local diner. I accepted their invitation, as I also needed to go to my bank before we continued our session in the afternoon. We had a great time at lunch. They turned out to be a charming couple. From our conversation, I learned that they studied at school a few years before me. Interestingly, David mentioned that he and Tom Gentry were in the same class, but they did not have a close relationship. It seemed that their competitive natures kept them at a distance from each other. During lunch, I found out that David and Sam have been married for about 10 years and are the proud parents of two adorable daughters, aged 6 and 3. They were happy to show me the photos, and it was clear that the babies had inherited their mother's beauty. Both girls had charming smiles reminiscent of the radiant smile of Sam herself. The time spent together at lunch had a beneficial effect on my well-being, contributing to a smoother transition to establishing mutual understanding with my new lawyer. But against the background of positive impressions, I felt that my life partner was no longer with me. The realization of this fact caused a surge of sadness. David and Sam's union was truly wonderful, and it served as a bittersweet reminder of the happiness I once shared with Kelly before I found out about her infidelity. A wave of sadness washed over me, and a couple of times, tears welled up in my eyes. David didn't pay attention to it, but I felt that Sam understood everything, and a worried expression appeared on her face. After lunch, I went to the bank to make a number of changes aimed at preserving my assets. In addition, I received a check for $5,000 in the name of David Warner's law office, which served as a prepayment for the upcoming legal work that they had to do on my behalf. Although David has not specifically asked for anything yet, I assumed that he would appreciate my initiative. Back in the office at 1.30 p.m., I was ready to resume our meeting. Sam informed me that David was on the phone right now and took me to a small conference room where we were going. She kindly asked if I would like to have coffee or other drinks, but I refused convincing her that I didn't want anything. Sitting down next to me, Sam held out her hand, offering support. Concerned about my emotional reaction during lunch, she confessed, David didn't reveal the details, Jack, but judging by your reaction, I can guess what will be discussed this afternoon. Paying attention to the wedding ring adorning Sam's finger, I realized that her assumption about the topic under discussion was most likely related to my wife. Understanding the depth of my emotional state, she kindly invited me to attend the meeting in the afternoon to support me. Overwhelmed with emotion, I just nodded my head, expressing my agreement. At that moment, my anger subsided somewhat, making room for strong emotions of resentment and sadness. I realized how important it is to have a woman who knows how to empathize because her sensitivity often helps to calm down in difficult times. It became clear to me that Sam's presence next to me could be incredibly useful during the afternoon meeting. I plucked up the courage and told the whole story of revealing Kelly's infidelity. The load of emotions turned out to be unbearable, and I broke down several times. Sam graciously supported me, offering sympathy and comfort when I needed it most. When I regained control of my feelings, I told both David and Sam about my intentions. If there were no unforeseen circumstances, I planned to file for divorce and fulfill the conditions prescribed in our marriage contract. David and I carefully analyzed the prenuptial agreement. Having studied its provisions, the conditions were quite simple and were as follows. I retained full ownership of all the assets of the farm, including real estate and personal property. Under the terms of the prenuptial agreement, it was stipulated that Kelly would retain full ownership of all assets related to the grain business. As for our financial assets, in the absence of infidelity, Kelly is entitled to 50% of these assets. But if the fact of infidelity is proven, then her right will be reduced to $25,000 per year instead of the full 50%. In addition, the agreement stipulates that in case of my infidelity, the right to financial assets is limited to $25,000 per year, which corresponds to the same conditions as Kelly's. As for household personal property, regardless of the circumstances, it is divided equally, 50-50. David demanded proof of infidelity, to which I replied, 
David, I have the necessary proof of Kelly's infidelity. I have videos that clearly demonstrate her participation. David, I understand your point of view, but at the moment, I don't want to show the evidence to you or anyone else unless we are forced to present it in court. In this case, I will share them with the judge, I said firmly. David persisted, insisting that he needed to see the evidence to make sure we had a strong case for infidelity. Guessing the importance of his request, I continued, David, you have to trust me. I have the evidence you're looking for, but it's hard for me to reveal what I witnessed, especially given my feelings for Kelly. I would prefer to keep this information secret unless it becomes absolutely necessary. At that moment, Sam reached out and touched David's hand, silently expressing her agreement. Reluctantly, David finally gave up and reluctantly agreed to act without immediate access to evidence. In the days that followed, Kelly repeatedly tried to contact me, leaving messages that I preferred not to listen to or respond to. Meanwhile, David contacted me and informed me about a meeting scheduled for Thursday with me, David, Kelly, and Richard. The purpose of this meeting was to ask Kelly some important questions, the answers to which would affect my decision about the divorce and the grounds for it. Let's proceed to the presentation of events on Thursday. At 10.30 a.m., David and I arrived at Richard's office to attend a scheduled meeting with him and Kelly. When we arrived, I noticed that Kelly's car was already parked in the parking lot. We went into the office where Richard's secretary quickly directed us to a small conference room. We waited quite a bit before Richard and Kelly entered the room. Compared to the previous meeting at Richard's office earlier in the week, Kelly looked in a better mood. It was obvious that she had taken the time to get herself in order for this meeting as she radiated beauty. Despite the emotions bubbling in me, I tried my best to hide my feelings, not wanting her to see the huge pain I felt for her. She greeted me with a warm smile and expressed the hope that we could finally talk to resolve our misunderstandings. Kelly openly admitted that she misses me and wants to come home. Overwhelmed with emotions, I decided not to answer right away as my voice seemed to break under the weight of feelings. It was very important for me to regain control of my emotions, and I understood that I had to solve this difficult task. David intervened in the conversation, who turned the attention of the meeting participants to the divorce process related to the dissolution of our marriage. He suggested opening the discussion to give each side the opportunity to express their thoughts and opinions on how we should live on. Richard nodded and joined the conversation, saying that his client considers this a significant misunderstanding and welcomes the opportunity to resolve all issues directly with her husband. His words involuntarily ignited a fire in me, bringing my anger to a boiling point. Oddly enough, this outburst of anger also helped me gain control of my emotions, allowing me to cope with the resentment and disappointment I felt towards Kelly. At that moment, I realized that I would be fine. Gathering my strength, I calmly replied, that's perfectly acceptable to me, Richard. Your client can really talk to her husband. Looking across the table at Kelly, I began by stating the indisputable facts. Kelly, let's clarify a few points. When we got married, we signed a prenuptial agreement, and two years ago, we made changes to it when you acquired a share in your father's business. To ensure transparency, I have spread out copies of the amended agreement for all parties. Kelly seemed stunned, her expression indicating surprise. But Jack, I don't want to get divorced. I want to be your wife. Can't we forget about this misunderstanding and return home to find happiness together? Although her remark caused me a storm of emotions, I decided not to be distracted and continue the conversation, ignoring her request. The purpose of our prenuptial agreement was to protect our individual interests while recognizing the benefits of our union, I explained, looking directly at Kelly. Initially, the agreement was aimed at protecting the property stored in my family for several generations. Later, when you acquired a stake in your father's business, it extended to preserving assets that have long belonged to your own family. I paused a little before continuing, to make sure that the essence of our marriage contract is clear. In the event of a divorce, our agreement clearly states that I retain 100% ownership of assets belonging to my family, and you retain 100% ownership of assets belonging to your family. All debts related to the assets of the business will be assigned to the relevant business, and the other party will not bear any financial burden, I clarified, emphasizing the division of obligations for the business. Since we both contributed to the accumulation of assets of the spouses, 
our agreement provides for a specific distribution of funds and property depending on the circumstances of our divorce. I continued referring to the previously agreed section indicated in the documents submitted to us, pointing to the agreement. I clarified, according to this document, you have the right to keep all your personal belongings, including clothes, jewelry, car, and any other property that belongs exclusively to you as a woman. I have a similar right on my side. Continuing to explain the essence of the agreement, I added, as for all other non-agricultural personal property, for example, furniture, art objects, electronics, and so on, should be divided 50 to 50. The personal property of the farm, such as grain bins, machinery, equipment, should remain 100% yours since it is an integral part of the farm. In case of divorce, you are entitled to 50% of financial assets if there was no infidelity. As can be seen from the document, in case of infidelity, there are two exceptions to this distribution. In case of divorce due to infidelity, according to our agreement, the distribution will be adjusted, I explained, referring to the conditions set out in the document. In such a situation, if you divorced me because of infidelity, then when distributing, you would receive not the standard 50%, but only $25,000 a year, which in total would amount to $200,000. On the other hand, if I divorced you because of infidelity, the distribution would be the same, $250,000 a year, totaling $2 million, not the standard 50%. Taking a pause to collect my thoughts, I continued, Kelly, I'm going to ask you a number of questions. Your answers will determine whether I will decide on a divorce and on what grounds. Naturally, this will also affect the monetary distribution that may arise as a result of our divorce process. In order for our marriage to have any hope of survival, Kelly, it is very important that you answer every question absolutely honestly, I said firmly. If you refuse to answer or if I realize that you are lying, it will mean the end of our relationship. Do you understand the seriousness of this situation? Well, are you ready to go to such honesty for the chance to save our marriage? Kelly was sitting in a state of shock, clearly stunned that I had read her the prenuptial agreement, but quickly pulling herself together. She replied decisively, Yes, Jack, I understand. I will answer your questions honestly. I love you, and I am determined to work on our marriage and make it flourish. I'm ready to do anything if only you would stop and let me go home. Can I write down these questions? Do you mind this time? Kelly hesitated for a moment and looked at Richard, who had remained silent until now. Richard, like a typical lawyer, said, Kelly, I wouldn't advise doing this. But at the end of the day, it's your decision and what you think is important. My lawyer, David, chimed in, Kelly, I agree with Richard and would advise you or my client not to record this, but Jack needs to be convinced, not Richard or me. In the end, do what you think is right. I am ready to do whatever it takes to get rid of this misunderstanding, so yes, write it down. I absolutely do not mind that our conversation was recorded on tape. David and I took a tape recorder with us and put it on the table so that it recorded all the voices through microphones. Then Kelly asked, Jack, what are your questions? Kelly, I want to ask about your loyalty to me, but I would like to consider this question in three different time periods. The first period I would like to touch on is the time from the day we promised to be together to the day of our engagement. Can you confirm if you have been faithful to me during this time? Kelly replied with a smile, yes. Jack, I was faithful to you during this period. But her smile quickly turned to shock when I replied, Well, that's lie number one. You couldn't even answer the very first question honestly. I thought about leaving right now but decided not to do it yet. I continued, Are you telling me that you didn't meet Larry Evandale just two days after we agreed to be exclusive? So you're saying that's what happened, Kelly? Was Larry the guy? I asked. He was prone to bragging, and in fact, he was bragging to me that you invited him to your house on Tuesday evening when your parents were not at home, and he had an intimate relationship with you on your own bed before he left. He said to me, Jack, she really liked it, and I'm sure I'll have many more opportunities in the future, even after you marry her. You can, of course, argue that he fabricated all this, but oddly enough, Amber was there and overheard everything. After Larry left, Amber came up to me and said, Jack, Kelly really loves you, and she won't betray your trust anymore. Please don't do anything stupid. At that moment, I realized that Kelly had already deceived me, but I could understand her actions, even if they were unpleasant to me. 
I decided to forgive her this lie this time, but I made it clear that there would be no more indulgences from that moment on. She had to be extremely honest with me, otherwise, she was in danger of consequences due to a lack of trust. After this incident, I watched you closely for the next six months. During all this time, you behaved in a way that did not arouse my suspicions. Then I realized that I could trust you again, and I asked you to marry me. I proposed to you and gave you the ring you're wearing on your finger right now. But I deliberately kept you waiting because I wasn't ready to fully trust you yet. Question number two, during our engagement, from the day you got the ring to the day of our wedding, did you betray my trust, Kelly? Without thinking for a minute, she firmly replied, no, absolutely not. I already knew her answer because even at that moment, my level of trust was not complete. I continued to watch her throughout this year until I felt confident enough to trust her. Richard, to his credit, offered to take a break. He wanted to consult with his client and give her the opportunity to rebuild. Both Richard and I noticed that during my outburst involving Larry Evandale, Kelly became very emotional and seemed to be on the verge of a breakdown. It was important that she had a chance to calm down before we continued working. We decided to take a break for lunch, and David and I stopped by his office to pick up Sam. Then we went to a local diner to taste the signature dish, Blue Plate. Sam asked how things were going, and David replied, Well, it's been pretty stressful so far. I think Jack is coping well with the situation. Sam commented, Not everything is revealed yet, but he laid the foundation for an honest conversation about the period of their marriage. If Kelly admits everything, he may still decide to divorce, but perhaps he will also see that she sincerely wants to save their marriage. It will undoubtedly be a difficult decision, but I believe in his ability to make it. When Sam looked at me, her feminine intuition kicked in, and I realized that she felt my pain. I smiled weakly and replied, the situation is certainly not easy. Why do people make such stupid choices and bring so much pain into their lives and into the lives of those they love? I sighed, feeling the weight of this question. Sam carefully placed her hand on top of mine and noted, if we could only have known, Jack, we would have hammered it into their heads before they could do such a stupid thing. Her remark made both David and me laugh. Even in this difficult time, I found solace in the opportunity to laugh together. It reminded me of the incredible resilience of humanity. People mourn at funerals, but they also find moments of laughter. Just as people grieved during a divorce, they can find reasons to smile. I smiled back at Sam and expressed my gratitude by saying, Thank you, Sam. It really means a lot to me, I said gratefully. Sam just nodded back. After the lunch break, around 1 p.m., we returned to Richard's office to meet with Kelly. Before proceeding to the next question, I reminded Kelly of the need to answer it absolutely honestly. I stressed that any form of deception would lead to the immediate termination of the meeting and the disappearance of all hope for our marriage. I asked her directly, do you understand that? Kelly firmly replied, yes, I understand, and I'll tell you the truth. Taking a deep breath, I continued, Kelly, from the day we got married to this moment, have you ever been unfaithful to me? When tears welled up in her eyes, I couldn't help but feel a huge sympathy for Kelly. I understood how painful it was for her, but I couldn't comfort her or offer an easy way out. I needed her to genuinely care about our marriage and confess everything. I wasn't sure that her complete frankness would be enough to stop the divorce, but I knew that if she told the whole truth, it would mean her willingness to fight for our marriage. Yes, Jack, she finally admitted, her voice full of remorse. I really cheated on you. I'm sorry, Jack. Will you ever find the strength in your heart to forgive me? I asked Richard and David to leave the room as I had a few more questions for Kelly, and I wanted to save her from unnecessary embarrassment in front of other men. Both objected, but I firmly insisted that David leave, and Kelly nodded to Richard, making it clear that she wanted him to leave too. By taping her confession of infidelity, I got the evidence I needed for future divorce proceedings. There was no need to record further conversation, and I turned off the recorder. Taking a deep breath, I addressed Kelly directly, Kelly, please answer the following questions honestly. When did it happen? Where did it happen? Who was involved in it? And why did it happen? I heard her snore a few times, her voice filled with remorse. Oh, Jack, I'm so sorry. It happened over the weekend at Peace Ball. 
I cheated with one of the massage therapists named Mario. I don't have a clear answer to why this happened, Jack. It was rather a spontaneous act caused by the passion of the moment, she continued, recounting the events. Amber and I spent such a pleasant day together, and after a wonderful dinner, we decided to treat ourselves to a massage before going to bed. Mario turned out to be my massage therapist. I was lying on my stomach on the massage table, and when he started the massage, I felt incredibly pleased. His touch was gentle and firm at the same time, and I have to admit that it was very pleasant. Kelly's confession hung in the air, and the severity of her act affected both of us. I didn't do anything to stop her. Kelly confessed with tears in her eyes. At that moment, I didn't even imagine that things could get to such an extent. Her voice trembled as she continued, Jack, if I could just turn back time, I would never let this happen. We wouldn't be in such a painful situation right now. You have to believe me. Tears flowed freely, testifying to her remorse and suffering. Although I was shocked by these revelations, it took me a while to process everything. Kelly's request for forgiveness touched me to the core. Kelly, I'm deeply wounded, and I can't find the words. I replied sincerely, but I will try to find a way to forgive you. It won't be easy, but maybe we can work on healing together. I waited in silence, hoping that Kelly would continue to share her thoughts, but she was silent, lowering her head and sniffling. Finally, she raised her head, her eyes full of uncertainty. Jack, is there any hope that you will forgive me? She asked, her voice filled with despair. Not wanting our conversation to resemble a trial but understanding the seriousness of the situation, I cautiously asked the following question, Kelly, I need to know, is this true, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Watching her expression, I noticed an unusual mixture of surprise and an unspoken question, as if she had a burning question but could not formulate it. There was curiosity and uncertainty in her face, as if she was thinking about how much I really knew. After a while, she regained her strength and spoke, Yes, Jack, that's how it was. I'm really sorry. Despite the heartbreak, I somehow managed to hide both the pain of her betrayal and the anger caused by her lies. I pulled myself together, got up from the table, and went to the door. I invited David and Richard back into the room. After looking at both of them, I firmly stated, The meeting is over. There was a robbery at my house. Detectives found evidence pointing to a break-in. I paused for a moment, shocked by the gravity of the situation. Kelly, I'm divorcing you on the grounds of infidelity, I announced. There was sadness and determination in my voice. The conditions of the marriage contract will be fulfilled. Shock showed on her face, and she asked, But why, Jack? I have confessed my betrayal myself, and I beg you to forgive me and continue our marriage. Please, Jack, please. I love you so much. Please forgive me. Tears welled up in my eyes when I answered, my voice choked with emotion. Kelly, it's not just that you cheated, I explained, my heart breaking even more. It's the lie. You didn't show enough care and respect for our marriage to voluntarily reveal the truth. Our foundation of trust has been destroyed. Even if you confessed, I'm not sure I could stay married to you. I said with sadness in my voice, but you didn't even give us a chance. You had the opportunity to be frank, and you chose to lie. I know that you cheated on me, not only that time with Mario, and I have proof of it. I warned you about the importance of telling the truth, but it seems you don't care enough about me and our marriage to do that. With a heavy heart, I turned around and took hold of the door handle. When I started to enter, she screamed, Wait, Jack. I'll tell you everything, everything you want to know. Please don't leave me. Her plea echoed in a room filled with despair and regret. I turned back to her, my eyes filled with a mixture of pain and rage, and I looked at her. You were warned, I growled, my words harsh and cutting. You had a chance, but you thought you could get away with just one case, and you lied. You had your chance, Kelly, I shouted back at her, resentment and frustration pouring out. It's over. David hurried after me and caught up with me as I was approaching the car. He grabbed my hand tightly, trying to understand my intentions. Do you really want to file for divorce because of infidelity? He asked, his voice filled with concern. Yes, I replied decisively. She had a chance. I must have somehow misjudged her all these years. 
I wanted her to value our relationship so much that she would confess everything. The pain in my voice was obvious, but even now, she couldn't find honesty in herself. I muttered with annoyance, come on, submit the documents. I drove to our house, which now belonged only to me. When I entered the house, I reached for the refrigerator and took two bottles of beer. When I reached my office, I sat down at my desk and practically gulped down the first bottle, desperately trying to drown out the pain and confusion. I drank the second beer more slowly, giving myself the opportunity to comprehend the events that had happened. I carefully kept several copies of the videos in safe places, but I did not expect that they would have to be made public. After all, her confession in itself had enough weight and evidence. A memory flashed through my head of how I left the office without an important tape recording. In a panic, I quickly dialed David's number. It's Jack, I said urgently. Did you take the recording of Kelly's confession before you came for me? Oh, I heard him mutter on the other end of the line. No, Jack, I completely forgot. I rushed to catch up with you and completely forgot to grab the tape. I'm sorry. I carefully thought out all the details of our plan, but in my resentment and anger, I ruined everything by leaving without the tape. Damn, I took a deep breath, feeling a mixture of disappointment and annoyance. Well, David, I replied with restraint, we will have to look for another way. It's unfortunate, but we can't dwell on it right now. Let's regroup and consider our options. Why don't you try calling Richard and see if you can come back to his office to pick it up? I suggested, trying to find a solution. But it seems to me their answer will be something like this. We thought that you had everything you needed when you left, so we erased the record, I added, feeling a sense of pessimism. I'll be surprised if you manage to get it back, but don't worry, even without it, I have enough evidence to press charges of infidelity. It's alright, David, I reassured him, feeling his remorse. I understand that we were hoping to avoid using the videos, but if she disputes the accusation of infidelity, we may have to rely on them. Don't worry, in the end, everything will work out. When I finished talking to David, disappointment and regret overwhelmed me. I went to the refrigerator and got another bottle of beer, trying to drown out the growing feeling of stupidity. Alcohol, although not completely intoxicating me, dulled my senses, and I slouched in an armchair, mindlessly watching the evening news, intending to go to bed for the night. A faint noise caught my attention, and I slowly got up from the chair. Something was wrong. Going to the back door, I went out onto the porch, and my eyes adjusted to the darkness. At that moment, a dark figure appeared in front of me, and then suddenly, darkness fell when the lights went out. Before I could react, some force hit me on the back of the head, and everything turned white. A burning pain seized me for a moment, and I plunged into the abyss of unconsciousness, falling into complete darkness. I woke up from the beep, cautiously opened my eyes, and looked around without making any sudden movements. I remembered the lesson I learned from the previous experience. In the corner of the ward, I noticed a nurse sitting in a nearby chair. Hoping to correct my position, I tried to move, but to my disappointment, I was unable to do so. Hi, Jack, I'm Susan, your nurse, she calmly introduced herself. Please try not to move. Everything will be fine, and I'll explain everything when you calm down. Could you lie still? Do you understand? Feeling something stuck in my throat. I managed to nod my head slightly, making it clear that I understood her instructions. Yes, I understand, I replied weakly. I need to inform the doctor that you have regained consciousness, Susan said, her voice sounding soothing. We'll be back soon. I nodded again, confirming her words. When she left the room, I lay motionless, gradually figuring out that apparently, I had been wounded and taken to the hospital, but the details of the incident remained a blur in my head. I resigned myself and waited patiently for someone to give me the necessary information. After a while, I heard footsteps approaching my bed. Mr. Hagen, Jack, I'm Dr. Julius, a calm voice addressed me. As a result of the robbery of the house, you received several injuries. But now that you have regained consciousness, I can reassure you that you will be fine. Rest assured, we will do everything possible to help your recovery. Unfortunately, we had to apply restraints to prevent further injuries from excessive movements, Dr. Julius explained sympathetically. I'm sure you experienced a lot of pain when you tried to move yesterday, am I right? 
I had no reason to smile, but involuntarily, a weak smile appeared when I nodded in agreement, realizing what agony I had to go through. Dr. Julius admitted his mistake and expressed regret. We should have used limiters more actively to save you from unnecessary pain. I apologize. Turning to Nurse Johnson, he continued, I think we can lift the restrictions now, but Mr. Hagen, please refrain from acting independently for now. Understand? I nodded to confirm his instructions, realizing that caution and patience were necessary for my recovery. I gestured to the tube in my throat to make it clear that I understood. Now we can remove the ventilator, he whispered, realizing the discomfort he was causing. Nurse Johnson skillfully removed the restraints and proceeded to remove the tube. The momentary relief was accompanied by a sharp pain in my throat, because of which I could not speak at first. I was given a small sip of water to drink, and after a while, I was finally able to speak, albeit with difficulty and in a hoarse voice. Hungry for answers, I quietly asked, Will someone tell me what happened to me? I couldn't stand the uncertainty anymore. The doctor answered gently, Jack, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and you've just regained consciousness after being on a ventilator. You realize that your throat will be sore for at least a few hours, Dr. Julius gently explained. Now you need to rest and recover. Nurse Johnson will stay with you, and as soon as you rest, we will inform the police that you can communicate. I'll give you some time before the call so you can recover a little, but you will need to talk to them so that they can tell you in detail about what happened. I nodded, understanding the need for rest and the upcoming conversation with the authorities. Dr. Julius continued, from a medical point of view, you were injured, but the doctors were able to resuscitate you in time and solve the problem. To put it bluntly, Jack, you were physically assaulted. Given the circumstances, you are, in a sense, lucky. We will continue to monitor your condition closely for a few more days, and then you will most likely be able to go home, Dr. Julius informed me. As promised, I was allowed to rest for the remainder of the day, while Nurse Johnson closely monitored my condition. By late evening, I managed to sit down with substantial help, and with their support, I was able to go to the toilet. During our conversation, Susan, Nurse Johnson, and I got to talking. I found out that she went to school three years later than me. Her maiden name is Susan Fisk, and she married Chad Johnson. She said that she has a charming three-year-old daughter, Emily. It was a small consolation to find a connection with someone against the background of the circumstances. It turned out that Chad, like Kelly, was unfaithful to Susan, which led to their divorce. When I told her about the details of Kelly's infidelity, Susan showed sympathy and understanding. The next morning, early in the morning, I found myself in the company of two police detectives, Harold Robbins and Josh Carter. Before proceeding with the investigation, I asked to be brought up to date. Detective Robbins agreed and said, based on what we have been able to find out, we are talking about a robbery that took a violent nature and led to harm to you. We found a wooden block on the porch next to you with traces of your hair and blood. To our surprise, we found no fingerprints on the bar, which indicates that the perpetrator most likely worked with gloves, explained Detective Robbins. In addition, there were no signs of forced entry in your house. Presumably, this happened because you went out on the porch, leaving the door open. Then he shared his findings during the search of the house. It turned out that several paintings had been removed from the walls. In one of the desk drawers, we found an empty cigarette box. The filing cabinets in the study were carefully blocked, and the drawers and cabinets in the bedrooms had traces of a search. In addition, we found empty drawers and missing jewelry from the casket in the master bedroom. We have signs of a robbery, but it is not yet known which items were stolen, Detective Robbins explained. Detective Carter then added, as soon as you are able to return home, you will need to assess the situation and try to determine what was stolen. The doctor said that it may take another three or four days before discharge. At this point, we will accompany you to review and make appropriate changes to the reports. Detective Robbins took responsibility again and continued the interrogation. Can you remember any details about the attack and what happened afterward? He asked. I regretfully replied, unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't remember much. Reflecting on these events, I told him, I drank a couple of bottles of beer and was fascinated by watching the evening news. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a car approaching the yard. Curiosity prompted me to investigate, and I went out on the porch. In the semi-darkness, 
I saw a figure hidden by a shadow, and then the light went out abruptly. Continuing, I confessed, after that, nothing remained in my memory until yesterday. I'm afraid I won't be able to help identify the perpetrators or recall further details of the incident. Detective Robbins nodded understandingly, acknowledging the limitations of my memories. However, he continued by asking, where was your wife at the time of the incident? Sighing heavily, I replied, my wife and I have separated due to the fact that we are at the stage of divorce proceedings. I do not know about the whereabouts of my wife at that time. I answered honestly. Detective Robbins paused for a moment and then asked, Tell me, Mr. Haugen, can I call you Jack? I nodded in agreement. He continued, Is your divorce going peacefully, or are there disagreements between you? With regret, I confessed, I have to say that everything is not going very well. She disputes the grounds on which I intend to file a lawsuit. Detective Robbins leaned over to me with a serious expression on his face and asked, And what are these grounds, Jack? Taking a deep breath, I replied, I plan to file an application based on infidelity. Besides, we have a prenuptial agreement, the amount she will receive in the divorce is significantly underestimated, and she actively disputes it. Given these circumstances, it's understandable why she has every reason to harm you, Detective Robbins expressed his disbelief. I just can't imagine that she would do such a thing to harm me, I said. It's okay, he interrupted. We will still thoroughly check this possibility during our investigation. Are there any other people who have a motive to attack you? Have your business relations deteriorated recently? Have you had any disputes or conflicts with neighbors, friends, relatives, or anyone else? No, I can't remember, I replied. Okay, Jack, I understand. We will need to conduct a thorough inventory of the stolen items when you have the opportunity. But now... I would like to ask two specific questions. First, did you have cash in your house, for example, in a safe? If so, what was the amount of cash? Also, did you have any other valuables in your home, such as jewelry or works of art, that would be worth thousands of dollars or more? Yes, there was indeed a certain amount of cash stored in the safe. In my opinion, it was about $8,000. I usually keep about $10,000 freely available, but recently I used some of them for payment, so it's probably about $8,000 now. As for jewelry, there were several items worth more than $1,000 among them, but nothing else of note comes to mind at the moment, I explained. I did not disclose the existence of a hidden safe behind the bookcase for two reasons. Firstly, the detective did not mention it, and secondly, I am sure that no one would have discovered it, and I would prefer to keep this information secret if possible. Well, Jack, I think we've exhausted all the questions for today. If you think of anything else, please contact me. When you're ready to go home, let me know so we can take inventory. If we have any additional questions, we will visit you here or at your place of residence if you find yourself there within the next four days. I had plenty of time to sleep, although I also participated in conversations with Susan. Several people visited me during my stay here, including Wally, Amber, David, and Sam. Kelly didn't visit me during my stay, and besides Amber, none of her family members came to see me either. This is probably understandable given the circumstances, but I would be glad of their presence. Nevertheless, Richard, Kelly's lawyer, visited me. We had been friends for many years before the start of this divorce process, and I was grateful for his visit. Everyone expressed sympathy for my injury and wished me a speedy recovery. Both Amber and Sam kissed me on the cheek before leaving, their eyes full of tears. During these four days, I experienced several difficult moments. Although I managed to fall asleep, I realized that sometimes I was tormented by nightmares. I would wake up abruptly with my heart pounding, tears in my eyes. In some cases, I woke up not realizing what was around me. But Susan was always there, soothing me with gentle words and gentle touches. There was at least one occasion when I woke up screaming, but I can't remember any details of the nightmare or the reason for my screams. Later, I found out that Susan stayed by my side in the hospital even when she wasn't on duty, going out only to freshen up and change clothes. She explained to me that it was due to the personal significance of the events related to my marriage, which deeply affected her, and she wanted to provide support. I was sincerely grateful to her for her presence and care. Dr. Julius came to see me to tell me that I was being discharged. 
I felt relieved and did not waste time preparing for departure. Susan kindly helped me get ready and even wheeled me out into the hall and out the door where Wally and Amber were waiting to take me home. She wished me luck and hugged me warmly. I realized that she genuinely cares about me and I really appreciated her support. But my life was in complete chaos, both in marriage and in health, so I decided to abandon further relations with her. I expressed a desire to contact her sometime in the future and left everything as it is. When I entered my house, the remnants of the mess were still visible. Wally and Amber kindly offered to help me put things in order, but I preferred to leave everything as it is for now, wanting to evaluate everything carefully on my own. In conclusion, I want to say that I was able to identify the person who attacked me and robbed me. As a result, I successfully liquidated her family's business. I assured Wally and Amber that I would contact them when I felt ready and ask for their help. Reluctantly, they agreed and left me to myself. Without delay, I entered the office and checked the safe hidden behind the bookcase. To my relief, everything remained intact, including a significant amount of cash, certificates of deposit, stocks, and bonds. It was clear that no one had found the safe and taken its contents. A DVD with evidence of Kelly's infidelity was also in the safe. After carefully examining the rest of the office, I noted that apart from cash, a laptop, and a few numbered wildlife prints, nothing else was missing. I didn't find anything missing, not even Terry Redland's paintings, but I noticed that bank statements and credit cards were spread out on the table, which made me think that someone had looked through them. Concerned about the possible compromise of my account numbers, I contacted the bank and the credit card company and asked them to monitor suspicious activity. Unfortunately, the investigation of the robbery and assault progressed sluggishly. The police had no substantial evidence that could link this crime to any particular person. Detectives Robbins and Carter kept me updated on the progress of the investigation. Unfortunately, so far, no significant leads have appeared. They explained that since expensive items were not stolen, attempts to track them through fences or illegal markets are likely to be fruitless. During our last conversation, both detectives said that the case would be temporarily discontinued if there were no significant evidence in the early stages of the investigation. They asked probing questions about Kelly and our relationship. I fully cooperated with them. In most cases, I was honest and frank. I was firmly convinced that Kelly was not capable of harming me since it made no sense for her to take things that she would have received anyway in a divorce. It seems that the detectives shared this point of view since no significant events occurred in the investigation of her involvement. In order not to lose caution, I decided to open new bank accounts and print new checks, as I suspected that my old accounts could be hacked. Fortunately, there were no suspicious actions that I could not explain. Despite this, I felt more confident opening new accounts. In addition, I purchased a new laptop computer and reorganized my office to start from scratch. I'm finally back to normal. When I sat down to deal with a bunch of bills that had accumulated during my absence, one particular account from Reds caught my attention. It was like a light bulb lit up in my head. The inscription read, Remote Electronic Data Storage Solutions. Suddenly, for the first time since the robbery, it dawned on me. Reds is a company that provided video surveillance on my property. Their services extended not only to the house but also to grain bins in a machine shed. The video image was transmitted in real time to a computer located in my grain office next to the bins and dryer. Every night, as part of the backup system, the video was uploaded to Reds. I realized that Reds saves video data for me, and I pay a monthly fee depending on the amount of data stored. In order for the fee to be minimal, I regularly went to the archive and deleted the oldest records every month. I haven't deleted anything from the archive since the robbery. Fortunately, this meant that I had a record of the entire day of the incident. Impatiently, I logged into the Reds website and got access to the videos of the day of the robbery. I downloaded it to my laptop, hoping that the quality of the recording would be sufficient to identify the person who attacked and robbed me. If the video is clear enough, I plan to make a copy of it on a DVD. I decided to provide the uploaded recordings to Detectives Robbins and Carter, as I thought it would help reopen the investigation. But after carefully reviewing the records for the day, I realized that I could not offer detectives anything significant. This has led me to the frustrating certainty that the crime is likely to remain unsolved. After paying the bills and realizing this, 
I turned my attention to how I should live on. Inspired by the idea of acting, I contacted my old college friend who was currently working at Cargill. Thanks to this connection, I arranged a meeting with decision makers in the procurement department. It's really amazing how personal connections can contribute to achieving goals. After about two weeks, I finally agreed on my plans with Cargill and decided to go to Las Vegas. But before returning home, I made a stop in Phoenix to resolve some business issues. As soon as I got back, I started implementing my plans. I contacted David and asked him to arrange a meeting for me with Kelly, her brothers Tom and Carl, and her sister Amber at Gentry Grain. I asked David to mention that due to the upcoming divorce, the state grain reserves will no longer meet the necessary requirements, since they will not include the grains stored in my possession. I asked David to let them know that I was interested in a conversation to discuss the current situation and find a solution. It seems that David's message surprised them as they agreed to meet with me without hesitation. Apparently, they did not take into account the possible consequences of my absence in their plans. When I entered the office, I greeted everyone. Hello, Tom, Carl, Amber, Kelly. I think you understand one of the reasons why I think it is necessary that we sit down at the negotiating table and resolve some outstanding issues, I said. When Tom started talking, I raised my hand to signal him to stop and said firmly, I believe that I have called this meeting, and I suggest that all of you just sit and listen to what I have to say before making any comments. I sincerely believe that it will be useful for everyone. With the utmost sincerity, I added, first of all, I would like to resolve the issue of divorce once and for all. My apologies, Kelly, putting the final version of the divorce papers on the table in front of her. I asked, please sign your name, Jack. I don't want a divorce, Kelly pleaded. Whatever you think I did, it's not worth throwing away all those wonderful years that we lived together. I would like you to find the strength to forgive me and solve our problems together. Doing this in front of my brothers and sisters is not the best option. Kelly, we have to end this now, I said firmly. Our marriage has no future, and the sooner you sign these papers, the sooner we can both move on. Kelly's face turned red, and she defiantly said, Well, if you insist on a divorce, I will still fight the accusations of infidelity. It's the least you can do for me. Expecting Kelly to play this card, I was ready to answer it. If you decide to challenge the accusations of infidelity, Kelly, I said calmly, I will have no choice but to present this DVD as evidence in court. With determination, I put a copy of the DVD on the table next to the divorce papers. I've reached out to them all to make sure they understand the gravity of the situation. If you don't understand something, here is video evidence of all eight cases. Yes, take it. When you cheated on me at the spa, Amber's face turned scarlet, and she stared at Kelly. You're not Kelly. How could you, she exclaimed. You told me that you handled it the same way I did, shut your mouth when you were addressed. Amber expressed her disbelief and disappointment, confirming the truth of my accusations. Yes, Amber, she really did, I agreed. She dodged Mario the first night Stephen approached you, then she dodged Stephen the next night. During your second visit to the spa, she went to see Mario all three nights, and just recently, she was with him three times again. So yes, there are eight videos of you cheating with Mario, which is substantial proof of my accusation of infidelity. With firm determination, I demanded Kelly's immediate submission. Sign the divorce papers right now, Kelly, or I'll go to court with this evidence. I won't play games with you anymore. I noticed that Tom and Carl were equally shocked, and Amber was crying quietly while Kelly reluctantly signed the divorce papers, leaving her one copy. I collected the remaining copies and put them in my briefcase. Despite the expression of stupor on Kelly's face, there was a hint of unshed tears in her eyes. The reason for her tears remained unclear, but it no longer mattered. It seems that she was shocked to learn that I have evidence confirming numerous cases of infidelity, but she had yet to experience another disappointment. Now, let's move on to another question, the question of grain, I continued. I feel like you are all in shock after hearing what I just told you, therefore, I will be brief. But unfortunately, this will worsen the situation. The sad news is that due to our divorce, the value of the grain stored at my place will no longer be taken into account in your reserves, thus violating the terms of the grain storage license and the loan agreement. If we talk about more positive aspects, 
Then I turn to your father and outline my position to him. To my advantage, there was no first refusal clause in your agreement with him. As a result, he agreed to sell me his 52% stake in the business. It seems that Richard has not made the most profitable acquisition deal for you after all. Without showing proof of your infidelity, I managed to convince your father that I have incriminating evidence, therefore, he took the situation as an unambiguous solution, realizing that the company would face significant difficulties without my participation. He sold his shares to me, making me a controlling shareholder of Gentry Grain Incorporated. As a result, each of you now owns 12% of the shares, leaving the group in the minority with a combined share of 48%. Unfortunately, I have to share another unpleasant news. I have successfully negotiated the sale of a controlling stake in Gentry Grain to Cargill. Cargill is closely monitoring promising grain operations, and Gentry Grain is ideally suited to their criteria. At the price offered, the positive thing is that you have the opportunity to sell your shares to Cargill at the same price that I secured as a result of negotiations. I strongly recommend considering this option as I have made an exceptionally good deal. But the downside is that now your company is passing into the hands of new owners, and they will evaluate the value of each employee for the organization. As a positive point, I want to note that within the framework of my negotiations, each of you is guaranteed one year of work. I urge all of you to show maximum dedication during this period and prove your value to the new owners. It is necessary to make additional efforts to show your value as employees. In addition, I want to inform you that I also sold my farm to Cargill, and Wally followed my example by selling his farm. But Wally signed a long-term contract with Cargill to manage both firms using his exceptional skills and experience. When I noticed the increasingly deep shock mixed with notes of rage on their faces, it was Tom, being the oldest and unofficial leader of the Gentry family, who finally spoke, expressing his disappointment. What the hell have you done, Jack? You single-handedly destroyed our family business just because my sister made a mistake, Tom said angrily. What kind of person are you? How did you manage to convince my father to sell his shares? What lies did you feed him? I took a pause to calm down before responding to Tom's accusations. Let me be clear, Tom, I said firmly. Your father sold his shares to me not because of fraud, but so that you, Carl, and Kelly would not face legal consequences. I paused, making it clear that my words didn't make sense. Instead of asking what kind of person I am, perhaps you should think about what kind of people you and your brothers and sisters have become. With these words, I threw the second DVD on the table, making it clear about my presence. I believe that this video will give you answers to questions about the reasons for all this, I said calmly, putting the DVD on the table. It clearly shows footage of your presence on my territory on the night when I was attacked. It clearly shows how you and Carl attacked me. On it, you can unmistakably see how you leave my house with my things. Consider yourself lucky that instead of involving Detectives Robbins and Carter, I chose this path of revenge. Kelly finally found her voice amid the tense atmosphere. Jack, how could you do this to me? She demanded, tears flowing down her face. My tone turned somber as I replied, Kelly, your case is completely separate. You make me feel like I've wasted my whole life. Your father may have shown some decency towards my father, but that doesn't justify your own actions. Throughout our relationship, you treated me like a second-class farm boy, always considering yourself superior to others. This feeling was not shared by Tom and Carl, who did not make me feel inferior. Although we were best friends, I felt your hidden condescending attitude towards me in various manifestations. As a lover, you were deceptive, promised exclusivity, and in fact, slept with Larry Evandale. You have become a cheating wife, showing great disrespect to me and to our marriage by having an affair with other men. Remember, when you watched this video, I witnessed every second and heard every word. You turned out to be a terrible person. You understand perfectly well that I almost died as a result of this brutal attack, Kelly. You came close to killing the man you claim to love so much. Doesn't that make you incredibly awful? At that moment, Kelly lost consciousness, and Amber and Carl rushed to her aid, managing to catch her before she fell off the chair. Amber quickly brought a cold cloth to revive her. As soon as Kelly came to her senses, I struck the last blow. Now you all know that your father sold me his shares so that all three of you wouldn't go to jail, I said. He's not particularly proud of his kids, except for you, Amber. 
I am sure that in the future, you will face the consequences of your actions, and undoubtedly, you will hear a lot about it. As I said before, Kelly, I think I've spent a significant part of my life on you, but I refuse to spend my future on it. I wish you all the best in your life. With these last words, I confidently walked out the door, knowing that all agreements had been settled. Now, I was free to move forward and start a new chapter of my life, and most likely with my dear and caring nurse.